Republican extremists are dragging their party further to the right, and they're appealing to a rapidly declining number of people. A CBS News poll conducted immediately after the State of the Union last night found that only 9% of people disapproved of the president's proposals. But there are plenty of Republicans still scrambling to appeal to those nine percenters. I just told you about Georgia Congressman Paul Brown accusing the president of not believing in the Constitution. There's also South Carolina Senator Jim DeMint, who told reporters after the speech, quote, it's hard to take the president seriously. That's quite ironic coming from him. And then Tea Party darling Michelle Bachman goes out and rants about big government dictating what kind of light bulbs we can buy. More on that nonsense later. But these far-out Tea Parties aren't isolated. Their fringe views are increasingly dictating Republican policy and dissing it from what Americans actually want. Take so-called entitlement spending. The Republicans, as we've been hearing, are threatening massive cuts. But almost two out of three Americans would rather pay higher Social Security and Medicare taxes than see those benefits cut. And other polls show 85% of Americans don't want Social Security cut under any circumstance. The GOP are similarly out of touch on the military budget cuts. In a hearing today, Republican members of the House Armed Services Committee criticized Defense Secretary Gates' proposed budget cuts. But a majority of Americans say that they'd cut military spending over Social Security or Medicare. Even 42% of Republicans prefer military cuts. With all this pandering to the extremists, at some point, the GOP is going to destroy itself. They are rapidly losing touch with real mainstream America. Now let's talk a little bit more about that with NBC political analyst, former governor of Pennsylvania, Ed Rendell. Governor Rendell, great pleasure to have you here. My pleasure, Jank. I'm former governor by seven days. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, you don't know this, but I actually got your autograph back when I was going to school. You were at a Penn basketball game and I got it on a card and it said, good luck, Jank, Ed Rendell. Well, and here we are again. It panned out. It panned out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now uh, on to serious business. Uh, look, you know, we think, and it looks to everybody like they're going more and more extreme, but yet Governor Rendell, they did win in 2010. So how do you explain that dichotomy? Well, uh, first of all, I don't think the American people focused on what they were talking about. They looked at the recession. They looked at the party that was in power. We got outspun badly on stimulus. Stimulus kept unemployment from ratcheting up to 11 or 12 percent, but nobody would believe that. In the stimulus bill, almost half of it was tax cuts. Nobody would believe that. In the stimulus bill, every working American family got a tax cut, but nobody would believe that. We just got outspun badly on that. We got outspun badly on health care. And they were able to convince Americans that these were big spending programs that had no effect and no benefit. People are starting to find out now that health care had a whole lot of benefits. And uh, uh, the president did a very good job of, you know, letting the American people know what some of those benefits were. And the tide is beginning to turn. But it's not just the far right. You know, if you ask Republicans about Paul Ryan, they'd say, well, he's one of our leaders. He's a responsible leader. Well, you did a good, a good job, Jenk, pointing out that some of his positions on Medicare and Social Security are way to the right. But how about the outrageous? statement he made about a hammock for able-bodied Americans. That's the same pap that they gave us during the campaign where they attacked the extension of unemployment compensation. Well, let me tell you, in Pennsylvania, the average unemployment compensation grant was $310 a week. I would like Congressman Ryan to explain how a family of four is going to exist on $310 a week and how anybody's going to take that money and not look for a job and swing away in a hammock. It's, it's a lot of bull, but I think the American people are beginning to learn what the alternative was. And when they learn that, I think they're going to turn very quickly away from the Republicans. Yeah, and the thing that I never get about this whole hammock idea is these people were working before the Great Recession caused by the big banks. Yeah, absolutely. And so what, did they all of a sudden all become lazy at the same time? <laughs> absolutely. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and some of these people were great craftsmen. In, in Pennsylvania, we had one of the best uh, furniture making uh, uh, sh shops anywhere in the country. It closed down because of the housing bust because nobody was buying new furniture, new cabinetry. These were artisans. These were people who loved their craft. 
and they're scrambling to see if they can get jobs as, as checkers uh, at a supermarket. I mean, it's nuts. What these people are telling the American people is so detached from reality. And I, be, 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 I believe we're beginning to have that learning process. Now, having said that, Cenk, I think it's incumbent upon us not just to win the next election. That's important, but it's incumbent upon us to govern. The reason President Obama went up so much in the polls is not because he moved to the center, in my judgment. It's because he showed the American people he could lead and he could govern. And I think he's got to continue to do that. The reason that his speech was so well received is because he talked about real things. People understand that we've got to move ahead in the future, and to do that, we've got to do the things we've got to invest. No business grows without investing, and the president did a great job laying that out for the American people. So what I'm interested in here is because I think politics leads to policy, right? If you get the politics right, you get the law, uh, right laws passed, right? So I want to game plan the politics here, uh, here a little bit with you and see how it works out. Because the Republicans will come out swinging, and they'll pass a lot of this stuff through the House because they have the majority in the House. And then presumably the Democrats in the Senate will vote it down, and then we're at a standstill. What happens next? How, how do the Democrats counterattack? How do they get their priorities through? Well, uh, again, uh, what I, th I thought the president did what he had to do in the lame duck session. But I would love to see, come 2012, a vote on the extension of tax cuts for people who are in the top 2% of the uh, richest people in the country. Let them go on record, the Republicans, as voting to continue those tax cuts while they're slashing social programs, where they're slashing safety net programs. The dichotomy there would scare the living daylights. You know, the Republicans talk about all this stuff but are they willing to cast a vote a vote that someone running against them can say hey folks do you know this guy voted to cut education funding and close down uh, full-day kindergarten classes but at the same time he wouldn't raise taxes on the top two percent richest people in the country for, for example, I think we could get a gun control bill passed right now, a bill that reduced the allowable limit on magazine clips to 10 bullet magazine clips. I think 75 to 80 percent of the American people would be for that right now. And the way you get it passed is make them vote no. Make them vote no so you give their opponent an issue at the next election. And I, I bet you you'd be surprised at how many Republicans would shy away from that. You think that they're going to vote to privatize Social Security? How many Republicans in swing districts are going to vote to privatize Social Security? I can tell you four or five Republican congressmen in Pennsylvania who would not vote to privatize Social Security. They'll talk about it, but when it comes to a vote that become an election issue, they're not going to do it. That'll be really interesting. I, and I don't know if that's the case, but if it is, then those votes are going to become very, very interesting to see which side those Republicans fall on. And, and I think you're right, though, in, in pressing your case. I think Senator Sanders was right earlier in the show. And you need a strong president, whether it's gun control, whether it's Social Security, to hold the line. But, you know, it, it's a great conversation there, Governor. I do want to ask you one more question that's unrelated to this. Sure. Glenn Beck has put you on his intelligent minority list. You're one of nine people <laughs> who are apparently secretly controlling the world. Um, how did you get to Together with Sigmund Freud, did you use a time machine <laughs> to do so? Uh, what's your do you have any response to that that crazy conspiracy theory? Well, did you ever see the movie Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? You know, they had that time machine with George Carlin in the phone booth. Right. Well, we have a phone booth in the back of my house in, in Philadelphia, and, and that's how we do it. We get into that phone booth every night. We can go anywhere. You can meet Attila the Hundemar if you want, Cenk. Is he part of the intelligent minority? I don't know. Beck didn't say it. <laughs> Attila the Hun would be a Republican, no question about it. <laughs> Rendell versus Attila the Hun. That's, that's what I'd buy a time machine for, to see that. There you go. All right. Former Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell and new NBC News contributor. Thank you so much for joining us.